Okay, guys, welcome um, to our Creating Carbon Credits on Tribal Lands. Um, this is gonna be presented by Brian Van Stippen and Nick Martin. Um, Brian, I have known for a little over, almost 10 years now. Wow, that's gone by fast. I've known Brian when he was practicing law with Ho-Chunk. Uh -huh. And then I, he was also an NTLA board member for many years. Um, assisted us uh, with that. Um, I've assisted Brian with some of his projects and just really uh, great knowing him. I'll let him go into a little bit about what he's doing now and maybe Nick can introduce himself because I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a bio for you, Nick. <laughs> so, and just a real quick announcement. Um, the welcome reception tonight is at 5.30 um, in the main ballroom and uh, hopefully we'll see you all there. It's gonna be cocktails and a dinner buffet. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Karen. Thanks to the National Tribal Land Association for allowing my organization, the National Indian Carbon Coalition, come and give a presentation today. And thank you everyone for making this three o'clock uh, time frame work for you. I know that everybody's had a long day in their first day of sessions. Um, I do have a booth over at the exhibition hall. So if there's any other questions that you may have or want follow up, I will be there for the next day and a half. So feel free to swing by the exhibitor hall and come and ask uh, any further questions, have any other comments, uh, conversations, anything that you're interested in discussing. Today I'm going to go through a PowerPoint presentation discussing how to create carbon sequestration projects on tribal lands. So my name is Brian Van Stippen. <clears throat> I'm the program director for the National Indian Carbon Coalition. I'm a member of the Oneida Nation and as Karen had mentioned, I'm a tribal attorney by trade. I assumed this position as the program director for the National Indian Carbon Coalition two years ago, so it's not my background. I'm learning it as I go along, and it's been a pretty fantastic opportunity. I get to, for one, work throughout Indian country, uh, have been approached by First Nations out of Canada, Native Hawaiian groups, and of course, Alaska Native Corporations and Alaska Native Village organizations. So I have a whole gamut of indigenous peoples that I am able to work with through my organization as a non-for-profit tribally and owned operated entity, which was created by the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, who supports the National Tribal Land Association in this conference that we're attending, as well as the Intertribal Agricultural Council. That's been around for many years, helping tribes in uh, throughout Indian country with sustainable management practices on tribal lands. So again, I appreciate uh, everybody participating in this conversation today. If you want to ask any questions at any point in time, please feel free to do so. I think the only thing that we ask is to make sure that you ask it into the microphone because this is being recorded and will be available for later use. Um, but uh, we'll get going here today and then I'm gonna pass it over to my cohort here, Nick Martin, who is currently with Excel Energy but used to be with the American Carbon Registry, who is an entity that I work closely with through the National Indian Carbon Coalition. So I'm gonna start through going through the PowerPoint here, hopefully. With just some very generic information for those that may not quite understand what carbon sequestration projects are, basically what we start with is defining what a carbon footprint is. All of us traveled here today to participate in this conference, air, you know, taking airfare, uh, driving your car, taking the shuttle bus to the hotel. I don't know if you're going to go to the Mall of America later, but taking the shuttle bus from the facility to the mall and back. As you do those transportation uh, usages and your day-to-day -day usage from hot water, uh, electrical use, you create a carbon footprint. And our goal at the National Indian Carbon Coalition is to work with tribal nations to offset their carbon footprint by implementing other types of practices on tribal lands. So once we determine what your carbon footprint is, we talk about carbon offsets or carbon credits. And what we see with the carbon offset is that it addresses climate change to encourage sustainable land management practices and clean energy. Um, a lot of tribes that have forest-based lands already have a sustainable management plan in place through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Um, my entity, uh, developing a carbon sequestration project, works hand-in-hand -hand with that type of a management plan, whether you have a commercial logging operation or not. Uh, so if there's tribes that do commercial logging, this works parallel to that type of uh, 
uh, economic development opportunity, or if you just start looking at implement, implementing sustainable management practices on tribal lands, again, this is a project that works hand in hand uh, with those practices. So a carbon offset is a reduction of the, the carbon dioxide or greenhouse gases. Uh, that's the very generic uh, term on what the, the carbon offset is defined as. And then what we want to try to do with that offset is create the carbon credit. Greenhouse gas management, as you can see from the slide here, we look at currently the, the easiest tribes or the easiest projects to develop on tribal lands are forest-based projects. So if you're a forest-based tribe, Right now, you're more than likely getting solicited by a lot of uh, organizations out there that do work similar to mine. Uh, it's essentially low-hanging fruit in the carbon sequestration world um, because they are multi-million dollar opportunities for certain tribes. See Alaska, uh, obviously up in Alaska, is developing a project right now along with Chugyung Limited, and they're projecting $100 million uh, revenue projects by developing these carbon sequestration projects. Um, I'm familiar with Pasamaquoddy out of Maine that has in entered into a project, and I want to say theirs is around $20 million. The Colville Nation out of Washington State, about $25 million. So some of these projects have the potential to derive a generous amount of revenue for your tribal nation. With tribal orchards as in Yakima? Uh, Yakima would also qualify using those orchards uh, because those Orchards are going to be remain and, and staying for quite some time because you're using it as another economic development opportunity. There is the potential to develop a carbon sequestration project off of those lands. So, again, in, in Yakima, you're, you have your practices that you're creating that produce um, in order to sell on a different method. This would be a potential opportunity to do another revenue stream for those for the tribal nation. So there are a few different types of carbon markets, and that's where uh, a little confusion lies at points in time, dependent upon the organization that you're dealing with. Um, I got uh, taking Yakima as an example. I believe they were approached by a couple of the for-profit entities, and it, with they're working with those types of organizations, they want to specifically focus on the California compliant market. Now, I'm a believer in the California cap and trade market. I personally don't have an issue with tribal nations creating a project and using that market to sell their credits. Some tribal councils do have issues with that. Uh, some tribal members have issues with that because their thought process, it's allowing polluters to pollute. That's not necessarily how it works, but with that being said, the organizations that are buying those credits on the California cap and trade market are usually the oil and gas companies and the major utilities that are based out of California because they are mandated to buy those types of credits. The interesting thing with the California cap and trade market is that just, uh, it's tied to the Ontario market out of Canada. Um, so there's also organizations out of Ontario, Canada that would be required, mandated, uh, that could potentially buy a carbon credit from a tribal project in the lower 48. Then there's also the voluntary market, which is a little bit more difficult to enter into because you're not guaranteed a rate on your carbon credit. It's more of a negotiation between an organization that would be willing to purchase that credit from a tribal project and then uh, determining what the, how many credits the tribal nation might be able to make. The hope is, in the very near future, with the International Air Transportation Association, is that the airlines have decided to enter into a voluntary market rather than a compliant market uh, because they don't want to be mandated to purchase carbon credits. So the airline industry as a whole is trying to determine how they can purchase voluntary carbon credits. Again, the downfall to that is that they are going to want to purchase carbon credits at a lesser rate than what the California cap and trade market is, and I want to say it's at $15.50 right now per metric ton, um, and that's how carbon credits are measured is one metric ton. Also, there's opportunities uh, here in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. We have some Fortune 500 companies like Best Buy, uh, 3M, Anderson Windows, Upanor, the Minnesota Twins baseball team. They have formed a group called Environmental Initiative, 
and this environmental initiative group works together to try to find out ways on how they off can offset their carbon footprint. Um, for example, Best Buy does not own any of their buildings in which their stores are located, so they don't have much of incentive to do energy efficiency in those buildings, put solar on top of those buildings, so they look for other methods on how they might be able to offset their carbon footprint for their employees, their customers, um, and their suppliers coming to that location. So Best Buy tries to do recycling projects, uh, tries to do composting at their executive building, which is just down the street here, but they can't offset their entire carbon footprint by doing those practices. So they reach out and purchase carbon credits or renewable energy credits uh, on some of these markets. And we're starting to see more and more organizations wanting to go in that direction because they believe it is in their best interest to start participating in these types of markets and start looking at opportunities on how they can offset their carbon footprint. So a little bit more about the California cap and trade, um, how we have the cap. There's regulations that were set. I believe last year in the state of California, the state legislature has to authorize the cap and trade program to continue. There was some changes that were made to the program that the projects that are created mainly have to be based in California, but there was an exemption for tribal projects in underutilized areas throughout the United States. So there was some concern that once the state legislature of California passed that uh, regulation of having only California projects that would ex not allow certain tribes to participate, they exempted that out to ensure that there could be tribal nation participation regardless of where that tribe was located. So that was a big boom to me for Indian country because again, my job is to work with tribes throughout the nation to work with Alaska Native corporations and villages, and we can still create a project and sell it on the California cap and trade market if that tribal council, business committee, legislature, board of directors decides that's the direction they want to go in. And then obviously we have the, the trade portion is once the, the project and credits are created by a project, they're then traded on that market that was created out of California. Um, we have recently seen in the state of Washington and the state of Oregon are looking at implementing <coughs> carbon tax programs. Um, I had the opportunity to meet with Governor Inslee from the state of Washington a few months ago before he announced his presidential campaign. And if anybody's seen what he's been promoting his campaign upon has been basically uh, focusing on climate change and how to address those issues. So as this 2020 election cycle comes to fruition, I'm sure you're gonna hear more and more about uh, Governor Inslee's campaign and how they're moving forward. Uh, in the state of Gannon, Washington, they had a carbon credit tax on the most recent ballot initiative, but it failed. And uh, I, from my understanding, there was millions of dollars spent on both sides, either to support it or to turn it down. And uh, unfortunately, we got about 42% of the vote, but we're seeing a big push from the Western states to implement either a, a cap and trade program or a carbon market program. So again, it's my belief in the next few years, there's gonna be more states implementing programs like California in which they're gonna mandate their industries within their jurisdictions to have to uh, adhere to these cap and trade programs or these carbon tax programs, which is gonna allow additional opportunities for tribes to create projects and then sell their carbon credits on those markets. A few other pro projects that are currently Going on, uh, Yurok is, was one of the first, along with Round Valley, uh, White Mount Apache, I mentioned Pazamaquoddy, and Warm Springs are currently ongoing. Um, the interesting thing to me is the Chugach Alaska Native Corp. That's another $100 million project that they're projecting. They, that tribal board decided that they wanted to retire their coal rights, so they had a big coal field that they had access to and they could have extracted that material then sold it on the market. They decided that that was not the direction they wanted to go in. They were paid to retire their coal rights. They implemented a, a carbon sequestration project and are now developing the carbon credits to sell those as well. So again, it's a avoidance or, of extracting or exploiting your natural resources to protecting your natural resources in a different form in which you can still derive revenue. And since this point in time, Spokane has come into fruition and I, no, that might be it. 
Um, I think the, like I mentioned, Spokane just came on board in 2018. That was the first tribal project in six years to be authorized by the, the California cap and trade markets. So there was quite a lull in there from which was really taking off until this point in time where now we're starting to see tribes be, again, more active in these types of projects. And of course, because there's a little bit of federal funding out there to allow tribes to do the, the feasibilities, to do the data collection, the, to, to determine whether or not these are gonna be viable on tribal lands. Um, so we went through the California market, which is a compliant market. Again, that's where it's mandated by the state of California that industry within that state has to purchase carbon credits. We are currently working with the Lower Brule Sioux out of South Dakota to do a grassland sequestration project. And we're trying to use this Plan Vivo standard that is based out of Scotland. So we have to get certain requirements because it's an organization not based out of North America to help do this project. But we're very confident that if we can get this Plan Vivo standard accepted through this Lower Brule Sioux project by some of the registries in the United States, that it could be very beneficial for Indian country, especially the tribes in the plains that don't have access to forced base lands. So if there's a grassland project, uh, there's a benefit to that because of all the forest fires we've been seeing on the West Coast. There's starting to be a movement to enter into these grassland projects because they're a little bit easier to manage, maintain, and they're less of a duration. And in a few slides, I'm gonna get into the positive and negatives, um, but grasslands are starting to be, uh, starting to gain popularity by some of the uh, big markets out of California. So I mentioned the offset registries. Um, as I said, Nick worked with uh, the American Carbon Registry prior to moving over to Excel, but the registries are the organizations that were created by the California Air Resources Board. The California Air Resources Board was mandated by the state to come up with these protocols because um, I don't know if, if anybody remembers the Chicago Carbon Market Exchange that failed a, a few years ago. A lot of times, a, a, a lot of the tribal projects that were being developed at that point in time were being sold on the, the Chicago Carbon Market Exchange, and that has left a bad t taste in certain tribes' mouths because of the failure of those projects. So when California created their, board, their, their market, they created a board to ensure that the science behind it was based in fact, and that these projects were going to be able to continue and survive over the duration of the time frames that was required. So again, when California created their cap and trade market, they wanted to ensure that this would be around for, uh, it wouldn't fail as quickly as the Chicago market failed. So they're, they're very, they wanted to make, again, wanted to make sure that it was based in science and that all of these projects were going to be able to continue for the duration that they were required to do so. Um, as I mentioned, Nick was with the American Carbon Registry. There's also the American our Climate Action Reserve and Vera were the other two. Um, each one has different types of protocols that they develop. And we'll start talking about the methodology standards uh, in this next few slides. So methodologies, as you can read by the slide, are basically the methods in which uh, travel programs can be created. When I first got brought on to the National Indian Carbon Coalition, there was a couple of different opportunities that we were looking at, and we're trying to figure out what would make the most sense for Indian country, and we had to work closely with the, reg the offset registries to come up with some of those opportunities. And these were ones that were already provided by the, the registries. We're looking at different sorts of uh, things that would work in Indian country, so we focused on a couple of these. These are the ones that we felt that would work best in Indian country. Um, energy generation, energy demand, transportation. Uh, if you have a landfill on your tribal lands, methane capture is a, is a big one that you can derive a lot of carbon credits from. Uh, there was also the, the, the main focus then for the National Indian Carbon Coalition was between agriculture, forestry, and land use. This is when we started working with the registries, what made the most sense in Indian country and we focused on these three. So these three protocols were developed by the National Indian Carbon Coalition along with the American Carbon Registry to work, to see if we could make work in Indian country. 
uh, improve forest management for non-federal U.S. forest lands. Uh, that is essentially uh, any sort of tribe that has forced, what, well, had forced ownership on their lands. Avoided conversion of grassland and sublands to crop production. Uh, that was a project that we were working with the Comanche Nation out of Oklahoma. They were trying to turn some of their lands uh, back into natural prairie habitat rather than ranching and grazing. And then compost additions to grazed grasslands. We were working with the Santa Ana Pueblo out of New Mexico. They had taken possession of, <coughs> excuse me, um, 65,000 acres contiguous to their current tribal land base. The hard part with trying to put compost down in 65,000 acres is that you have to create compost for 65,000 acres, and we couldn't quite get there. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen the Shakopee's facility right down the street here. Uh, that was a $10 million compost generation facility that feeds the fertilizer for their golf course, and then they sell excess fertilizer. But you know, it was a $10 million project to get what they needed to cover their golf course here. So we were trying to work with the Santa Ana Pueblo to do a compost facility as well, but you know, it's a lot of money to get those types of facilities established as well as trying to collect that material. So again, when, uh, when we were going through the opportunities, these were the three that we focused on. We then went out into Indian country and started working with tribes on seeing how we might be able to implement these practices. Those were the three pilot projects that we had initially started with. As I mentioned earlier, the market for grasslands is on the rise. Uh, we're starting to see uh, a big move to get these types of programs established. My interesting stat that I always thought was in between 2018 and 2012, there was 1.6 million acres of grasslands turned into cropland. Um, you know, as a tribal member, I don't particularly like seeing uh, lands that are being converted into different use unless we're doing it for tribal housing or some sort of development. But if we're just taking grasslands or forest land and just converting it into to cropland, we have enough cropland, I believe, in the United States and on tribal lands to not have to do conversions. And again, just a little bit more about the market for the grassland credits is on the rise. Um, <clears throat> these, are, these slides are going to be specifically based for forest-based projects. <clears throat> Those are the, the, the list that we had gone through earlier and showing where tribal projects were being generated are essentially all forest-based projects at this point in time. And those are the tribes that are getting very heavily solicited by the for-profit entities to enter into those types of projects. So when I'm speaking with tribal nations, it's usually a tribe that has a large forest base uh, because those are the ones that have the most interest at this point in time, again, because of the low hanging fruit. They've been done before. People are familiar with them. Industry is familiar with them. The California cap and trade market knows how to manage and maintain them. We know that they can sell the carbon credits. It's the easiest market to enter into. So here's just some of the benefit positives of that are is that you're going to be able to get potential revenue generation. Like I said, Pazmaquati is 25 million, Colville is 20 million, uh, Sea Alaska, Chug Young are 100 million dollar projects. So we see large dollars being thrown around at some of these forest based projects. You already have your BIA management plan in place if you're going to be a commercial or forest based tribe and use commercial logging operations. You have to have a management plan in place, so it does not. You, the the data is already developed. It does not encumber commercial logging operations. It works side by side with your commercial logging operations. And then, of course, you're a steward of the land. The negatives are extremely detrimental to some tribes. If you want to be on the California compliant market, the duration of the project is 100 years. My personal opinion, tribes have been here for time immemorial. Tribes are going to be here for time immemorial. What's 100 years entering into a program? Now, as an elected official, that's a different story. Um, you know, you're making, you're making decisions uh, for your tribe, and a lot of times tribal elected officials don't want to make those decisions 100 years out. So there's a concern about entering into the program. The 40-year time commitment is if you enter into the voluntary carbon market. That's the minimum uh, time frame that you can enter into a project. So it's dependent upon if you entered into the California market or if you've entered to a voluntary market, the, the duration of the project. But 
you know, even 40 years is a concern for elected officials. If you enter into the California cap and trade market, there is going to be a limited waiver of sovereign immunity. Again, I was a tribal attorney by trade. I feel tribes enter into limited waivers of sovereign immunity all the time, but that is a concern that some tribal councils, legislatures, business committees, uh, boards have, uh, as well as membership have when you're talking about these projects. So those are hurdles that have to be overcome. A big concern of mine, if tribes enter into these projects, is the time commitment to the staff because there is going to be an additional workload on internal staff, and you guys are all part of land departments. We know that you guys are busy on a day-by-day -day basis with just your uh, regular workload. This is additional work. It's not a ton, but it is a concern that we have to take into consideration. There is a reporting, record, excuse me, a reporting requirement of every six years that's mandated by the California Cap and Trade Program. They want to ensure that you are doing the protections on the land that you say you are in order to ensure that the carbon credit is going to be valid for the duration of the project. There is a cost to that. The cost is going to usually be built in on the front end of the project and set aside. And I wanna say right now it's being projected between 15 and $20,000 per six years for every time that that has to be reported because it has to be done by an outside third party. It can't be done by the tribe. It can't be done by the organization that helped to derive the project. It has to be done by an independent third party. So again, there's a cost to that. You know, you extrapolate that out over a hundred year time frame, you're looking at quite a few recording periods that are gonna take off the bottom line. But again, that's going to be held off on the front end of the development of the project. Restrictions on land. If you wanna build a gaming facility or hotel, don't include the land. If you're thinking you're gonna do tribal housing, in the future, don't include it in the project because it's very difficult to pull that land out once it's placed into this type of a project. So if you know on the front end, just keep it out in the first place. And then uh, obviously natural disasters, as I mentioned earlier, a big push for the grassland projects because they are not as susceptible to forest fires as obviously forests are. If there is a grassland fire, the grassland can regenerate itself in a much quicker fashion and you can still continue with your carbon project without having to uh, rely, uh, go back and try to figure out how much forest is still remaining on those lands. So that is pretty much my portion of it. It's going through the negative, positive and negative, a down and dirty understanding of what a carbon sequestration project might mean for your tribe. Um, as I said, I have an exhibitor booth here for the remainder of the week. I have federal funding through the USDA NRCS program to work with tribal nations on doing carbon feasibility assessments. I also have another pool of funding uh, that helps tribes with their GIS web mapping. That was one of the issues that we found early on when we start, started to try to develop some of these projects is unfortunately we would meet with tribes and they would roll out Department of Transportation maps that the state makes and say this is our land ownership. Um, that was very frustrating to me as a tribal attorney, as a tribal member, to see tribes not having that data available at their fingertips. Um, as Karen mentioned, I worked for the Ho-Chunk Nation and I leaned on her a lot because we did not have those types of services at Ho-Chunk that she had at Morongo Band of Mission Indians out in California. And she gave me all of the material on how I could 638 contract those services from the Great Lakes Bureau of Indian Affairs so we could bring that workload in-house and then start getting a better understanding of where our lands lay, what we developed, and if anybody runs into Matthew Cariaga uh, from the Ho-Chunk Nation, he's our first land director. When I left Ho-Chunk, he was just assuming that position. It took us four years to build that office, to put the people in place, but now that office does the leasing, the land use, um, the register of deeds, will collection. They have a whole gamut of information. We got TAMS access, Again, Karen helped me go through that process so that we could have direct access to our land records so we had a better understanding of what our land base was, what the ownership was, and how to address and, and manage and maintain that land. So now that I moved over to the Indian Land Tenure Foundation, that was a goal of my boss, was to provide tribes those same and similar type services so I can assist with helping develop web maps uh, through a pro third party that we use um, and I'm currently working with the uh, Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, uh, Jamestown Scalema out of Washington, 
Sault Ste. Marie tribe out of Michigan, uh, I think as well as the Bay Mills Indian community uh, up in that area as well to do a web mapping projects or in the Eastern Band of Cherokee out of North Carolina. So for all of those tribes, we are helping develop their web-based mapping systems. So that's the first step that we would take to look if there was a need for that for your tribal entity. And then if that data and information is all available, we can look at trying to do a carbon feasibility uh, right off the bat to determine whether or not it would be economically viable for your tribal nation, your tribal entity to derive revenue off of their natural resources. So again, I'm gonna be here for the next day and a half over in the exhibitor hall. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to ask right now or if you want to have more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation, please feel free to visit me over there in the exhibitor hall. Yes, sir. The, the feasibilities we can have done between four and six months. If we want a web mapping project, we're looking at two to three months. Um, it's really dependent upon internal staff help. With Eastern Band of Cherokee, we had some issues with their IT department. They were trying to implement new hardware so the project's taken about a year. With Bay Bales Indian Community, we're in the final phases of that, and we just signed on with them at the beginning, or at the end of last year, so a couple months. The feasibilities, it's just dependent, again, upon the, the communication between the parties. How quickly can information sharing occur? But we, can, our, we strive to have it done within four to six months, because we want the tribe to know where they're gonna be going in the future, and again, elected officials aren't always there, so we wanna make sure that we're getting the information to the council and staff as quickly as we can. All right, I'm gonna pass it over to Nick Martin, my cohort here today. Um, as part of our grant funding, we had to develop a tribal guidance document. Nick was instrumental in helping us do that and develop that information. Um, so I'll let Nick do a quick introduction to himself since apparently neither him nor I put bios together and he'll do an introduction on what the tribal guidance document and the the meaning of it for Indian country. Great, thanks, Brian. Um, so um, my history working with tribes, I started out my career working for the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission in uh, Portland, working on fisheries research and uh, fisheries management and so on for a couple of years. And then I moved from there to working for the Zuni Indian tribe in New Mexico. On, uh, th at that time, Zuni had a, was just uh, sort of developing and staffing up um, a natural resource department. This focus very much on kind of watershed restoration, um, Zuni agricultural knowledge, um, solar energy, things like that, um, and for forestry. So what, what I did there was forestry. Uh, Zuni didn't have much of a forestry program. The Bureau of Indian Affairs ran, and I think still does run forestry on the reservation, but the tribe was trying to build up some of that capacity, and we created a, um, uh, a tribal forestry enterprise, a sawmill providing lumber to the community as well as uh, working with um, some of the adjacent landowners, the U.S. Forest Service and others on uh, wildfire risk reduction projects on a little bit on the reservation and also on the national forest lands neighboring the reservation. So I, st I started there, you know, got my interest in working with tribes on natural resource stuff. From there I mig migrated to other things, working on forestry, other parts of the world, and then from that, uh, working on forest carbon sequestration, which is what led me into the, the position that Brian mentioned. The American Carbon Registry is one of several, um, not several, I should say, but Brian mentioned them. There's about three major offset project registries in the, in the United States. And uh, what I did there was develop the offset protocols. So the like, the counting document, you know, like the, the methodologies that, that look at how to, how to count uh, carbon credits. And we did that for a broad range of different project types. I'll talk about some of them, and Brian's already mentioned some of them. But a lot of them were related to forestry, uh, agriculture, um, also non-land-based things, like working with the oil and gas sector to, to reduce uh, methane emissions from oil and gas production, or working with um, trucking companies to reduce diesel idling by plugging in at, at, at uh, plugging into electricity at truck stops. So kind of a broad range of stuff. So, um, so ju that, that's just to give you a little sense of my, my history and how I come to this. Um, the American Carbon Registry um, 
partnered up with the National Indian Carbon Coalition and was really interested in developing some guidance to facilitate carbon projects on tribal lands specifically. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you about the guidance. Uh, if you have specific project ideas or things you wanna do, Brian's your guy for that, for sure. I'm just gonna talk to you about the sort of guidance document and where, what it, why we have it, where it came from, and, 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 the, and the purpose. Um, so I, 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 th I think the, the genesis of this project was really recognizing that uh, carbon projects on tribal lands both face some unique uh, opportunities and some unique kind of challenges or barriers. So the opportunity side, you have like, some tribes have large land holdings, a long-term stewardship ethic, uh, desire to sort of uh, manage natural resources well, consolidate um, the uh, land tenure, all those things go along with uh, carbon projects really well. They sort of complement each other. On the barrier side, as everybody knows, uh, tribal lands, regardless of what you're trying to do on tribal lands, you face a lot of barriers around, you know, history of land takings, checkerboarded lands because of that history, uh, uh, natural resource, uh, it's sort of staffing capacity, all of those things that are challenges to doing any land-based project are also challenges to a carbon offset project because many of those projects are land-based projects. So, um, so we created this guidance with the idea that it, it wasn't about um, trying to impose any additional requirements on tribal projects. Um, the American Carbon Registry had its, has its standard that applies to all projects that are registered, tribal or not and has methodologies for quantifying carbon credits. Uh, but but it, so, so the, this guidance that I'm talking about uh, now is not additional requirements, but it's sort of trying to translate some of those requirements. How would you meet a particular registry or protocol requirement on tribal lands uh, to facilitate the process of tribes and all you know, various partners they might work, work with? Being able to create those projects, register them, work with the third party verifiers that Brian mentioned and so on. And also, I think we're really aware that, um, you know, there's a history, and, and Brian hinted at this as well, there's a history of folks coming to tribes with some natural resource project idea or mineral development idea, and somehow it seems like the benefits always go mostly to the non, non to the outside entity, the non-tribal uh, entity. So we were really aware that, you know, carbon offset projects could be the same thing if this weren't, weren't done pretty carefully. So. Uh, the American Carbon Registry's goal in putting out this guidance was also to make sure that the, 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 the benefits of doing these projects stay with tribes and tribal members. So, um, thank you, Are you I'll, I'll let you advance for me if you don't mind. Um, so I've got, the next two slides are a little bit of just kind of the scope of this guidance, what kind of projects, what kind of lands. So in terms of project types, um, Actually, any project for which the American Carbon Registry has an approved methodology is eligible, if it's on tribal lands, to register. There's not any additional limitation in this guidance. Um, the guidance tends to focus in particular on the land-based projects because those are the projects that you know, face some of these additional barriers and it can be challenging. So we thought you know, guidance on interpreting ACR requirements would be useful. Um, but it's not only those, there's also, the, the guidance also talks about energy-based projects uh, displacing fossil fuels. So um, some of the, met the project types that the American Carbon Registry has accepted, has uh, already approved methodologies for, you've heard about some of these already, uh, reforestation, so tree planting projects on lands that are not currently forested, uh, improved forest management or managing forests that are already forested, but are already under forest management, but to, to increase carbon stocking. Um, Brian talked about grassland projects, avoiding conversion of grasslands to croplands, um, compost additions, uh, projects related to, to livestock management. So there's a lot of things you can do with how livestock are managed to reduce, uh, to reduce methane emissions related to that. ACR has some methodologies for that. Uh, wetland restoration, we developed some really interesting methodologies around restoring wetlands in different um, deltas, so the, the Mississippi River Delta and uh, uh, Sacramento River Delta in California and so on. Um, agricultural projects around reducing uh, nitrous oxide, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas emitted from uh, fertilizer. Um, 
and um, coal mine methane capture, uh, a variety of other things. So there's a, there's a set of 20 or so methodologies that ACR has already approved and is approving new methodologies all the time, and those are all eligible, uh, not, not all equally relevant, of course, for on tribal lands, but all theoretically eligible. A little bit on land ownership types. Um, in, in, in starting to write this guidance, we realized right away that one of the biggest uh, issues was going to be what kind of tribal lands, uh, what are the kinds of tribal lands on which tribes might be interested in doing carbon offset projects, and what kind of guidance would be needed for, for different types of lands. So the scope of the standard addresses tribal trust lands and restricted fee lands that have a certain set of requirements. Uh, individual Indian-owned lands, uh, including uh, uh, trust allotments or allotments held in trust. Um, trying to address some of the challenges there around fractionated ownership, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, fee land, which is pretty simple. There's no, um, on fee lands, that's practically the same as doing a, a, a project on, on non-Indian lands, but, um, but sometimes tribes are, are transitioning fee lands into trust status, so we talk a little bit about that. Um, and then Alaska Native Corporation lands as well. So a little bit more on this. Um, you're really sharp. I don't have to even tell you. <laughs> um, a little bit more on this uh, allotted lands challenges. Um, if you've done any kind of land management projects on allotted lands, you know that, um, that it can be really challenging because you've got these sort of fractionated uh, lands with undivided interest owned by you know, dozens or, or hundreds of, of owners over the generations. And so in thinking about that, um, we, we kind of realized that the challenges of doing a carbon offset project are kind of like the challenges of just you know, getting um, enough of the owners to agree to any particular management activity, let's say to an agricultural lease. And so we looked at the guidance that's out there in the Code of Federal Regulations around um, uh, applicable percentages, uh, which I have up there, the idea that like if you've got you know, the, the more owners you've got with an undivided interest in a particular allotment, the, um, the, the percentage of those owners that, uh, that you have to get to sign off on a particular activity in order to bind the remaining owners kind of goes down. Um, so uh, as, as you get up to more than 20 owners, if you have 50% of them, as I understand, some of you may know this a lot better than I do, sign off on an agricultural lease, then they, that lease can go forward binding the remaining owners. So uh, we just modeled the, the ACR guidance directly on that. A carbon project also requires uh, you know, a certain, um, a, project, uh, a, a carbon offset project in general requires uh, the project proponent to be able to commit to a land management activity, for example. And so if you're trying to do a project on allotted lands, you might need to, uh, to look at um, getting uh, sign off from uh, a, a percentage of the owners. Um, and we also talked about how if, if the tribe itself, the tribal government, is trying to sort of uh, consolidate ownership in fractionated allotments and deal with that issue, the tribe, once it reaches that applicable percentage of, of uh, ownership interest, can also um, uh, uh, authorize the project on behalf of, of the allottees. So that was, that's some of the guidance there. Um, still, I'm sure, very challenging, but we wanted to put something out there in terms of how you'd think about projects on allotted lands. And feel free to ask questions as I go. I'm just going to keep going through this. Um, so then we thought about uh, the, the guidance really needed to say something about the BIA's, BIA's role on uh, trust lands. And this was pretty challenging because, at least at the time, and I believe this is still the case, BIA didn't have any uniform policy on carbon offset projects. Uh, I don't know if you know any change to that since then, Brian. Since then, nope. So, uh, so th there, there's, there was, there's not an easy answer to sort of like what, what, what kind of approval do you need to get out of BIA if you want to do a carbon offset project on trust lands. Um, uh, if you're doing your project on fee lands, fee lands, which some of the tribes have done, this is not an issue. But um, but there are some, some uh, activities that are within a carbon project that, require, that could require BIA approval. So again, what we, what we did here is model on the California market, uh, which basically says um, different BIA regional offices 
who have you know been asked this question have have dealt with it in different ways. But uh, if the re regional office either will s sign off on on a project or just provide a letter saying that it doesn't believe BIA's approval is needed, that's acceptable to the American Carbon Registry as well. Sort of trying trying to follow the same standard, um, and. Um, and you know some some carbon projects, especially those that that are not kind of long-term land-based projects, this doesn't become an issue. Okay, next, there's an issue of permanence that's kind of a a, a challenging thing that it, that um, it's actually related to what Brian talked about in terms of the long long uh, minimum term requirements. So what is permanence? Permanence is. Uh, applies only to some kinds of carbon projects, what we call sequestration projects, where the, the way that the project is generating carbon credits is to basically um, sequester in trees or in soil or in rangelands uh, carbon over time. And with, with those kinds of projects, there's a risk that you could have subsequent to issuing credits to the tribe and maybe the tribe has even sold those and some regulated entity has used the credits for compliance, you could have some event happen that causes a reversal of the sequestration, like a fire, for example. A fire hits your forest project, you've already sold the credits, uh, a utility or an oil company has already used those credits for uh, compliance, so you need to be able to address that risk. And it's, you know, it's, it's a small but not, not zero risk of that happening. So the way that um, this is, you know, ever since people started thinking about carbon projects, this has been an issue. It's not an issue for other kinds of offset projects that basically just avoid emissions. So if you think of, for example, if I'm creating biomass uh, energy and it's selling it to an entity that's uh, using that biomass energy and not combusting natural gas, well, that emission reduction or emission avoidance just happens that year and you can't like lose it the next year because it's just an emission avoidance. Uh, so so that's, that's why I say like it's only sequestration projects where this even comes into play. So the way that um, the, both the voluntary registries and California have tried to deal with this issue is basically assessing the risk of reversals specific to a project and then requiring projects to put a certain percentage of the credits, maybe it's like 10% of the credits, go into a buffer account. And then if there is a reversal, you can pull credits from there and retire those credits to, to compensate for the reversal. If there's not a reversal over time, I know ACR at least returns those credits to the project proponent and then they can sell them like the rest of the credits. So it's kind of like a risk buffer approach. Um, and so um, the way that, um, that ACR has, has dealt with this, only, again, only for these sequestration projects, is to say you have to commit to a minimum project term. That's the 40 years that, uh, that Brian talked about. So shorter than the California market, but still a significant length of time. Um, and you commit to, to basically uh, continue the project and periodically monitor and verify it through that time frame. And um, if, uh, if there's an unintentional reversal, say a fire or something like that, that's taken care of from the buffer account. If there's an intentional reversal, in other words, the, the, whoever it is just decides to discontinue the project, cut down the trees and sell them or something, you know, then uh, the, uh, the project proponent in that case has to commit up front to, to replace issued credits in the event they did that. So anyway, that's all background on sort of how sequestration permanence and reversals work in general. In terms of tribal projects, what we, um, what we sort of put into the guidance, knowing that we didn't want to require uh, sort of wait, ACR as a voluntary registry, a nonprofit wasn't going to ask tribes for waivers of sovereign immunity or anything like that. Um, what we, we needed to have some mechanism. So one of the things in, that's discussed in the guidance is uh, for projects um, on trust lands, they can use Hearth Act how do you, is that how you print? Hearth, 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 hearth yeah. Hearth. Um, anyway, the, the, the leasing authority where a, a tribe could commit to um, a 25-year lease and one, re one renewal would amount to more than the 40-year requirement that ACR has for those kinds of projects. So there's just a couple more topics. Um, the next thing has to do with what, what 
in the offset project world, you talked about is baselines and additionality. And so uh, in general terms, the baseline is just any offset project has to show the baseline is sort of business as usual. What's going to happen if we didn't do this project? And the difference between that baseline and the project activity is going to be some growth in carbon. Let's say, to take the simplest example, you've got agricultural land, and you're going to plant trees on it. Well, the baseline is agricultural land, it, the, um, let's say over the next 20 years, 40 years, remains in agricultural land, has you know, some carbon stocks, but pretty small. You plant trees, those grow over time. This one is kind of easy, at least for me, to visualize. And as the carbon stocks accumulate in the trees, the carbon credits are the difference between that baseline of ag lands and that project of carbon sequestered in the forest. Some project types you know, are, are harder to visualize, but that's the basic idea of any project. There's a baseline and a project scenario. So when we started to think about how is that particular to tribes, um, clearly uh, some tribes have a history of, of generally more conservative uh, natural resource management than non-Indian lands. So they maybe are um, maintaining higher forest carbon stocks than are typical on adjacent non-Indian lands, or uh, have lower livestock stocking levels than are typical. And so um, we wanted to think, uh, sort of strike the right balance between um, wanting to make sure that there's a real reduction or a real sequestration that happens. So we have to sort of look at, uh, that's one side of the balance, but the other side of the balance is we don't want to penalize tribes for sort of having a history of managing more conservatively or managing with a stronger stewardship ethic than non-Indian lands. So we had to strike a balance. And this, this kind of shows up in two specific ways. One specific way has to do with management plans. So in the California market, there was a lot of discussion around forest management plans. And if a forest management plan has a given sort of annual allowable cut that is uh, in the plan, is that, is, is that considered a, a legal constraint that becomes the baseline for the project? So you can't get credit for anything that you, you're doing unless it's on top of that, even though that level might be higher forest carbon than would be typical for, for non-Indian lands. And so the decision that, that ACR reached about this is, no, uh, forest management plans um, set general guidelines around sustained yield and so on, uh, annual allowable cut. But these are guidances, and uh, they shouldn't be treated as legal constraints because the tribe is able to do some uh, management around those constraints. So as long as you can create a project baseline that reflects something that could be realistically done in compliance with the forest management plan, you can create credits for, uh, in, in relation to that, you know, for changing from that, that sort of baseline. So we didn't want to sort of make it a, a, rigid, a rigid baseline. And you can imagine similar things for like an agricultural management plan or a rangeland management plan. Um, the second way this shows up, so that was like on tribal lands, you know, how to think about management plans. Second way is like if you compare uh, Indian lands to adjacent non-Indian lands, if you were to, uh, let's say, and let's say this is, a, what, it's often the situation where the tribe is managing at a more conservative level and, and keeping higher forest carbon stocks than is typical for the region because other lands are being harvested more aggressively. If we were to uh, only compare the tribe to itself, again, the tribe would get less credit because it's already been more conservative and that would seem like a sort of a penalty for good deeds, right? So to avoid that kind of thing, we, the, what, what it says in the guidance is, you compare yourself to a, a common practice in the region that includes, again, let's stick with the forestry example, forest carbon stocks that are typical both of tribal lands and non-Indian non lands, and uh, you set kind of a regional baseline, and then crediting to, to the tribe is in relation to that, which means that the tribe, there's some amount of credit that the tribe could get just for its having maintained uh, you know, good management, higher forest carbon stocks, and then, of course, the tribe might want to further um, adjust that management to increase carbon stocking in the forest and get credit for that as well. And then the last sli slide I have has to do with an issue called aggregation, which might be of interest to some of you. Um, aggregation um, is a, 
a, a um, practice within the carbon market to address basically all offset projects have a certain transaction cost, you know, of like Brian talked about doing the mapping or hiring the verifier or, you know, preparing all the documentation for a project. And if you uh, have a project that's, say, like one piece of land, a thousand acres, that cost might be X. But then if you could, you know, if you did a, a, a project that was uh, a thousand acres here and a thousand there and a thousand there, the cost would not be 3x, right? It's, it's not, that it doesn't scale. So in, in a sense, you can make a project more cost effective, make it uh, greater net revenues relative to the cost of doing a project if you could aggregate together different kinds of lands. And that's been done in, the, in uh, independent of tribal projects, that's been done in the carbon offset uh, market relative to agricultural projects and others. So if the goal is to reduce transaction costs, and then, and then sort of, again, as I've been talking about I'm, I'm, a lot of these, I'm sort of, sort of setting out a, a general issue, and then what does that issue look like potentially for tribal projects? You could imagine on tribal lands, uh, you could have um, uh, a single tribe, but it's got lands that it wants to put in the project that are in multiple locations. You could imagine a tribe that is acting as an agent, say maybe some tribal lands, but also some uh, individual Indian lands or allotments that it, that it wants to put together into the single project, kind of spread the transaction costs over all of those. Um, we already talked about how that that um, can be dealt with with uh, using the applicable percentage kind of approach borrowed from the leasing rules. Um, you could have a single tribe, um, or, or you could even have multiple tribes theoretically going in on a project together and designating one of the tribes as the lead entity. So the guidance talks about each of those scenarios a little bit, just to bas basically say, yes, these are all permissible ways to approach a project. You can meet uh, the American Carbon Registry's rules for projects by, by sort of making it all one project, and then you only have one set of project documentation. You verify it all together, so you don't have to pay the verifier separately to come to each each thing that if they, they were different projects and so on. So that's, I think that's my last thing. I'm, that was sort of to give you a sense of the scope of what's in the guidance, uh, how the guidance has tried to think a little bit about um, what projects on tribal, carbon projects on tribal lands might look like. Uh, I'm sure there's all kinds of things we missed because we're trying to sort of write a general document uh, that uh, it's often really difficult to imagine every particular every specific project that might want to use it. Uh, so the, the guidance is, is out there in version one. It's certainly open to continuing uh, change, changes and improvements um, as, as uh, tribes work with ACR to think about um, specific projects and maybe they need more guidance on, on given areas. So questions on that part of it? Well, I know that we threw a lot of information at you in this last hour. It's pretty fast and furious. It's, these projects are complex. There's a lot of hurdles that need to be overcome, but they are being done in Indian country. It's my belief that tribes can be leaders in this industry. I'm looking for partners to start developing these projects. Again, we went through that list that you saw earlier. This is ongoing. This is happening in Indian country. As the nonprofit entity that has received federal funding, my job is to spend that on uh, tribal projects in Indian country. So I have funding. I work with Nick and other organizations to help develop this information, help develop this data, so the tribes don't have to go out there uh, and being seeking this on their own. So if there are questions or concerns, you know, again, please feel free and come and speak with me. Our contact information is on the material that I handed out. Uh, send me an email. Uh, ask any sort of question you want because Again, it de it, depending upon where you are uh, within your tribal politics and the region of the country you're in, there's all sorts of different conversations ha going on. M my goal is if I can come in into your community and start the conversation, I feel that's a win. Because my parents' generation are the ones that started to create this issue. I believe my generation is starting to avoid the issue. And it's my kids' generation uh, that are gonna have to start dealing with this issue because in my opinion, climate change is real. We're seeing it happening day by day, and we're gonna have to start figuring out ways to address these issues as we move forward. And I believe that tribes can be a leader in this area, as well as derive revenue 
rather than extracting or exploiting their natural resources. So again, if there's any questions you guys have right now, we'll be here to answer them. If you want to come up, we'll, we still have technically 30 minutes on our presentation that will be around, or feel free to come over to the exhibitor hall and ask any questions, have any conversation you want. So thank you for your time today. Thanks for uh, listening to our spiel. Again, I know it's fast and furious. We threw a lot of information at you. It, it's, it is in depth, it's complex, but there are entities out there that are willing to help tribes enter into this industry. Um, the National Indian Carbon Coalition is one of them. So thank you for your time today.